You're listening to Rethinking Trade with Lori Wallach. Small business owners and farmers are protesting the green government. WTO and NAFTA are transnational forms of autocratic governance that support the European North American free trade agreement. Seattle has never seen anything like it. Fire and tear gas into the people. This is the Seattle Times Radio Network. Mexican workers have faced threats of violence. This trade policy has delivered one big punch in the gut after another. Welcome back to Rethinking Trade, where we don't just talk about trade policy, we fight to change it. I'm Ryan, and I'm joined once again by our in-house trade expert, Lori Wallach. Despite promises to bring back jobs, trade-related job losses have continued under the Trump administration. And Public Citizen just released some data about this, and I wanted to discuss that with you today, Lori, as well as the system through which we obtain this kind of data. But let's start with the numbers. What's in this new report? What we found is that Almost 180,000 workers were certified by the U.S. government as having lost their jobs to trade since the beginning of the Trump administration, just through the middle of 2019. So it's not even current data. That data is part of what's called trade adjustment assistance. It's really a big undercount relative to what the total job loss to trade has typically been because it only applies to certain kinds of jobs and workers have to know to apply. And then you have to fill out a quite detailed form that proves your job is trade, your job loss is trade related. So just under that TAA program, 176,982 workers have been certified by the U.S. Department of Labor as losing jobs to trade since the 2017 start of the Trump administration. And there are some states that have gotten particularly walloped. A, the largest by far number of, of job losses is California, but Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio uh, are in the top five. And Virginia and Washington State, that relates to a lot of job outsourcing by Boeing, are, are up in the top ones too. These numbers look pretty similar to numbers from past administrations, but Trump, of course, is running around talking about how he's bringing the jobs back and keeping jobs here to begin with. Shocking, but why are we still losing just as many jobs as before? Well, I think they're two different things. One is the trade policies themselves. So the new NAFTA, which was Trump signed it in 2018, was such a disaster, it wouldn't have stopped job outsourcing and it would have locked in high medicine prices, there were new goodies for big pharma, that the renegotiation had to be renegotiated. So it was much delayed and only went into effect just now, July 1st. So we had, despite the promise of a quick new NAFTA, we had the old NAFTA in effect. There have been various trade sanctions against China and our trade deficit with China did decline. But unfortunately, because the big systematic problems like currency cheating, the thing Trump promised to fix on day one of his presidency, well, nothing has been done. So as a result, even though the trade deficit with China went down, it was kind of like squeezing a balloon. The the deficit just moved over to Vietnam and other countries as compared to actually overall us having a smaller deficit and less jobs being lost to trade. So that's that's number one on the trade front. Number two is that the president promised they would stop giving government contracts to companies that were outsourcing jobs. And that would have been a huge incentive for a bunch of companies that are notorious job outsourcers to knock it off. But instead, there was a lot of rhetoric about buy American, hire American. But in reality, that campaign promised by Trump about no more government contracts to outsourcers has totally been ignored. So billions in government contracts have been awarded to Boeing, General Electric, United Technologies, and other firms that have been certified under that narrow database as outsourcing. So given we know the TA only covers the tip of the iceberg, it is pretty scary that even under that 
limited assessment. We see Boeing's outsourced almost 6,000 jobs during the Trump administration, $53 billion in contracts. GE outsourced more than 1,000 jobs, $6 billion in contracts. United Technologies, that's the company that's Trump made such a big fuss about. They're not going to be allowed to outsource. A thousand jobs gone. They got $9 billion in contracts. So both on the trade front and on the Buy American front, not a lot actually did change. Something significant to me in this story, and you just touched on it with the federal contractors that are still receiving federal contracts while continuing to outsource, but also the role of Trump donors, meaning companies that have donated to Trump while also outsourcing jobs. Maybe you can talk about some of that stuff. And aren't there rules against federal contractors outsourcing jobs? <laughs> well, Trump promised there would be new rules that banned companies that got federal contracts from outsourcing jobs. But that's not what happened, actually. So there were things the administration could have done. For instance, Trump didn't use, he failed to use the authority he has under existing law to basically stop the throwing away of Buy American for corporations in countries that we have free trade agreements with or that are WTO procurement agreement partners. And he also could have... Um, take an administrative action to basically condition, make one of the review topics for getting a government contract, the history of the company with outsourcing. But none of that was done. The result basically is by not using authority under the Procurement Act of 1949 or the Trade Agreements Act of 1979, Trump didn't use the authority he had with respect to those procurement outsourcers. And as a result, these companies that, yes, may have given him campaign contributions, but for sure were outsourcing during his presidency, still got these very lucrative contracts. And that's part of why you don't see the numbers changing. Can we go back to talking about some of the, some of the specific data here? You've described this as being just sort of the tip of the iceberg. So there's probably more, but maybe you could describe again some of, the, some of this data and how significant it is. You bet. So this program, Trade Adjustment Assistance, if you apply for it and you get accepted, you get an extended unemployment benefits period and you can get retraining money. Once it's been proved you lost your job to tra trade, you can be trained for a new job. And the problem is there is about a two-year lag, maybe a year and a half lag when things are quick. So we don't have the data for any of 2020 and we don't have all of 2019. We have about half of it. But even so, between 2017 and the beginning of 2019, 176,000 workers were certified by the Department of Labor as losing jobs to trade. And again, the reason it's an undercount is number one, it only covers certain kinds of jobs. So depending on what role you had in a factory or what, what sector you were in. But number two, workers needed to know to file. So either if they had a union or the company did it, but it's kind of a pain in the butt because there's a lot of information. Now, it's a good program to, I suggest people try and file, get their State Department of Labor, but you have to provide a certain amount of data to be able to prove your case that you're a trade-related loss. Yet, even with only really the 2017-2018 data, we see you know almost 180,000 jobs, but for instance, you see 16,000 of those came out of California, but then almost 10,000 from Michigan, almost 10,000 from Virginia, Washington State, 9,000, Pennsylvania, almost 9,000, Ohio, 8,000 plus, Illinois, 8,000 plus, Georgia and Texas, um, both around 8,000. And it is North Carolina, 6,000. If that's the tip of the iceberg of the ongoing job lost to trade under Trump, the prospects of, you know, what we're going to see through 2020, much less just even the full damage of those first two years is, you know, a lot bigger. And that is not what was promised up when Trump said he was going to quickly get rid of the trade deficit and quickly bring back lots of jobs and stop outsourcing. That's a lot of jobs. And it sounds like a lot of data 
maybe you could tell folks how they can access this data. And also, I know there's an interesting story about, you know, sort of public interest legal success in the fact that we even have access to this data. Maybe you could uh, talk about that for a little bit as well. So the trade adjustment assistance data, anyone can look at. Go to our website, tradewatch.org. That's www.tradewatch.org. Go to the Trade Data Center, and you will see a box to click on to get to the trade adjustment assistance database. We have gotten the raw data from the Department of Labor under a standing FOIA settlement, Freedom of Information Act settlement, so that we make it searchable. So up until the last couple of years, the data was only available literally on PDFs, scanned in paper copies of often handwritten applications. And so it was impossible to search. You couldn't aggregate the numbers. You couldn't break it out by states. It was just useless. So back in basically 1996 or seven, we settled the Freedom of Information Act lawsuit with the Department of Labor trying to get the raw data so we could actually search it um, and try and tabulate the, the, the trends. And so every quarter since then, we've received the raw data from the Department of Labor, and we hired someone to build a searchable database so that people can, you can put in your zip code, you can put in your congressional district, you can put in your town's name and your state, you can put in the name of a company, you can put in the sector, the economic sector. It's searchable in lots of different ways. You can do it by map and dra drag out a, an area of a town or a state that you want to see what happened. And you can get all the data mapped, but you can also get it down. Everyone can get it in an Excel file so you can actually search. That's how we can basically quickly keep tabs and everything. Now, again, it's a year and a half to two years behind when the job loss happens before it goes through the process and gets certified. So if you're looking and you are you know in your hometown, well, I remember that outrageous outsourcing to Mexico that happened right around Christmas 2019. Why isn't that in there? Like the carrier case, the United Technologies case that Trump made such a big deal about and the jobs won anyway. That's not in there because it's such a lag. So, you know, if you can remember something that really pissed you off about job outsourcing in 2018, type in the name of the company, type in your town, you'll find it. Anyone can use it. It's free to use. And yes, because we basically sued under the Freedom of Information Act, public citizens, lawyers were able to make this data not just available, but searchable, so useful to everybody. And it basically puts the truth to many presidents, including this one's claims of how these agreements would create jobs, not lose jobs. And you can actually look at the data of what happened and you can look at, you know, X town and 100,000 jobs in a state over the period of NAFTA. For instance, things you wouldn't expect, El Paso, Texas is the number one NAFTA job loss impact location. You'd expect that to be Detroit. Nope, actually, in a small geographic area, El Paso has more concentrated job loss. Or you can do it by sector and you can do it by time. So if you know from your town that's been clobbered by these race to the bottom corporate rig trade agreements, you can you want to go see a member of Congress who's been a little shady on whether or not we should replace our failed trade model, you can run your zip code, you can run your congressional district, and you can have the list. And the list will say the date, the company, the address, 1,000 jobs, 800 jobs, five jobs, 4,000 jobs. And it lets you actually know the real people who are affected by these failed trade agreements and why we have to fight to replace them. That's all for today. Thank you all for listening. Rethinking Trade is produced by Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. I would encourage you to visit RethinkTrade.org as well as TradeWatch.org to educate yourself and to find out how you can get involved in the work we're doing to fight for fairer and more equitable trade policies.